Okay, it looks like we are streaming again. Uh, sincere apologies to everyone watching and all of the guests who are here on this Zoom meeting too. Um, something of a technical uh, technical issue on this end. So it's it's all on us. I'm so sorry for the interruption, Howard. Um, I think you were discussing, before we came offline, you were discussing um, the development, the TRICARE development at Turinga. Um, so I'll throw back to you now, if that's all right. Sorry for the interruption. Thank you, Michael. Um, what I was about to say was that in the case of the TRICARE development, two specialist doctors and myself put a submission in on the code dealing with aged care. Now, decisions on development are made based upon codes, as most people might or may not realise. Now, we put a lot of effort into that and to explain that the code didn't really suit aged care, particularly people that are infirmed or with people with Alzheimer's. I have a, a brother in a nursing home and a cousin in a nursing home. So I'm very familiar with the general requirements of people in those sort of facilities. There was no regard given to any of the suggestions we made about how it be made for fit for purpose. And this supports the sort of comment that was made by Elizabeth a moment ago about codes being unsuitable for the purpose for which the, the development was intended. I've also been involved in a number of other developments where it's been quite apparent that uh, a code was applied which was inapplicable to a site as well. Example being one dealing with the parking code, street parking. I put a, a submission to say there was a dangerous uh, location in the street that I live in and which would affect the parking on that street. And when it was dismissed by the town planner, I inquired why, and I found out that they said oh, it complied with the code. And I asked them, did they actually check the site to see whether the code was really suitable for that site? And they said they didn't do it. They don't normally carry out site inspections. So how can they make a decision on a development without having understanding the facts of a to a situation? So I think that's a bit sad. There are a number of issues that um, uh, were raised by you and by, by um, uh, Elizabeth. And I'd like to sort of go through the things that I think are really quite important. I'm of the view that um, there should be much more appreciation by the community in planning. And a lot of it, the, the problems with planning are related to confusion about what planning in fact is supposed to achieve. We have a planning scheme, provisions in the Act, which allow people to input into what might happen in their area, but there's a, a great discontinuity between that and when it's actually implemented. There's an expectation that certain things will occur it doesn't occur and then people question that so because i've been aware of some of these anomalies i've actually run seven community discussions with community groups on how to achieve their future through planning and that's why i'm on this webinar this afternoon because it's most people don't understand how to get involved when to get involved and what information to use when they get involved it becomes a wholly emotive issue and i think it could be done better we need development. We need good development within the state, in Tuong, in Maywa. But people have got to understand what's going on. And if they feel that there's something wrong with that development, they should have the opportunity to contribute to it. Unfortunately, the planning legislation is very much a legalistic thing about how you do things rather than why you do things. So we have a situation where people don't do the basic things. I've suggested at one stage that the council... Christmas Eve Council provide certain guidelines to people. And I got told they're not required to do it because it doesn't say so in the Act. Now, that to me is inappropriate. So we have a situation where the Act is being used to selectively exclude certain options that people could undertake. They're relying upon following a recipe, which I think often is, isn't appropriate. So there's confu community confusion about planning, also about a preferred use. I thought as a planner in the past in rural lands, you, we're always concerned about what the future use of an area might be and how it might be developed for that purpose. We have a situation now where the planning schemes talk about use in a very general way in their, uh, their definition of zones and a number of codes, which are the rules to allow virtually any development to occur in that area, almost provided it meets that code. And that's why we have this confusion with people about suddenly something turning up, which is quite dissimilar 
than what they thought was going to be the case. So most people don't realise they need to get involved in looking at the codes and whether the codes, in fact, are in alignment with the expectations of an area. I've actually provided notes for community groups I've spoken to about how they input into planning schemes and subsequently how they input into um, developments which they maybe have some concerns with. The second thing is that um, developments at present are excessively discretionary. The, le the legislation allows that. We have situations, as occurred really with the TRICARE, with the, the uh, Planning Environment Court, where um, there's a lot of discretion left to the uh, to the in making an ultimate decision. So that in fact we have the ultimate decision being made in this case by the law, the court, with really a little practical knowledge about town planning and how it might affect the people living in an area. They know a lot about the rules and whether they can uh, comply with, but those rules, again, as I said before, don't necessarily uh, support what you would expect for an area. Performance-based assessment. I was really concerned when that arose in 997. I thought that being a person that's been involved in professionally in impact assessment work, that it would be following the same sort of approach where you looked at uh, whether a particular um, development would in fact um, uh, uh, meet the intended use for an area. But in fact, um, what we have now is we have proposals being put up, which are well beyond, I believe, the expertise of town planners because of the they've got trained to carry out certain things well beyond their expertise to assess. So because of complexity, we have a lot of decisions being made which are really made without understanding the situation. I was involved in a major development when I was in government with the a gelatin factory in, in Bow Desert. And at that time, uh, the uh, council initially supported it. Then there's a lot of public opposition, you know, it's community involvement, but they opposed it. But we'd actually done a lot of work in government to actually work out whether that development could safely occur. It did, has occurred, it's been built, and it's been the impacts the community were concerned about didn't come about. So community consultation is important if it's informed and people make decisions based on the facts rather than on emotions. So performance-based really re re depends upon having uh, town planners to have adequate expertise to really understand whether the uh, development meets the um, performance indicators which are in the in the planning scheme. Uh, I've mentioned about the codes which are inappropriate for a particular form of development with the TRICARE and the parking one a moment ago. Um, development decisions having little regard for the, the consequences external to the site of the development. I've actually got a, I'm on a, in a unit complex and we have a bunya pine and I'm very much a tree person. I've been involved in the national tree program over the years, but we have a tree that's been in a location where uh, it's got no future because it's been built in, built around by development. And now it's going to annoy the people that have been that built immediately below it. At the time I put a proposition forward to the council and said that now's the time to remove the tree, even though it's got a VPO on it, because that tree is going to cause a public nuisance and public impact. But because that tree was outside of the development area, it wasn't really seen as being an issue. So I was trying to explain to them that it, even though the a local law is involved, that local law should be linked in some way or other with the, the planning scheme. And it was quite apparent the decision was being made on the within the boundary of the property rather than what might occur outside it. So that planning schemes to me deal with cumulative impacts, most of which like water pollution and noise and dust and so on, traffic are ones which are more than what occurring on the site. It's the cumulative effect of sites. And this doesn't seem to be dealt with very well in planning schemes. In terms of the Tuong proposed development, I see a lot of merit in developing that area. However, I also see merit in Mogul Road not driving through the middle of um, this, the main street. Now, the argument will be it'll be too expensive to reroute the road. We come back to saying, well, do we have a development which increases the problem or do we have a solution which, in fact, avoids that problem arising? And it worries me the number of developments are put in which, in fact, limit opportunities in the future. I can see plenty of these sites around this place where 
something would have been suitable for maybe a diversion for a road or a park or something, but something's done which excludes that opportunity. So to me, it's really important that when decisions are made, they're explained to people and explained in terms of not what's going to be in the benefit of the community or economics, just general throwaway statements, but it should be in terms of some sort of criteria which people can comprehend, like, does this limit the opportunities that occur in the area? Does it have associated with appropriate infrastructure? Is the change irreversible in case you make a mistake like the TRICARE might, uh, sorry, the TRICARE, the um, uh, Atera one might be? I put an, uh, an objection on that because I could see that was a, a very specialised development which had very limited flexibility. I believe flexibility of choice in the longer term is really critical in planning. So planning is about anticipating a problem and avoiding the problem rising, making things clear to the development industry as well as the individuals. It's about looking to cumulative aspects because those things are not looked at when you're dealing with a development application. The Planning Act excessively focuses on managing development, not planning for the future. Um, the, so I'll just cover the issue about requirements for a planning legislation to be justified and the rationale is where the, the decision is not fairly obviously apparent to the individual. We've got to start off by understanding the other people don't know the things that the planners know. There's got to be a better dialogue between the two, better understanding. I belong to NIMBY, sorry, YIMBY, YIMBY Yes in My Backyard, which is a, a group of planners that are really trying to work with the community to get good development, which people can live with. If we had good planning at the front, we wouldn't have all these problems with appeals need for court cases. We wouldn't have all this public opposition. We, if we have people understood what was going on, you can never please everybody. But if people understand and realise that their views have been taken on board, they're more likely to be supportive of our proposal. The planning approach at present is excessively caught up with process. It's all about timelines and how you fill things out. A lot of questions being asked of people and developers too, which are in fact quite irrelevant to the needs for an area. I can give an example. I, I was involved with looking at acid sulfate soils at one stage, and we have a situation now where virtually every so site's going to be checked to see if it's got acid sulfate soils, and patently obvious that most of Queensland won't have that situation. So we have a, things being required to be done which are unnecessary and inappropriate. The last thing I'd like to raise is, which is a, real, a matter of concern I have about the way we might go from here, and that is that... Um, I interact quite regularly with lawyers in dealing with town planning and also town planners or friends of mine. And I realise that planning is difficult, it's challenging, you've got to accept a lot of social, economic and environmental considerations. But there's a reluctance for town planners to have further change. There's been so many changes legislation, they want things to remain the same because it's very complicated. I think that part of the problem is that they need to understand the change is necessary, but work with the community to come up with a mutually acceptable outcome. I think it's really important this happens. And if, if we do that, we'll remove a lot of disharmony in the community and hopefully better development. I'm not anti-development. I'm actually for responsible development, appropriate development. Excellent. Very well said, Howard. Thanks for your, like, as I said, you've got a, a wealth of experience over many, many decades. So we really appreciate your thoughts. And I think it's, you know, it's a good note to end on that, uh, you know, as I said before, I think the community that I represent now um, accepts well and truly that there, there will inevitably be, and there should quite rightly be intensification of, you know, of our, of our population here. Like um, we're in a, we're in a good place for it in a lot of ways, but we need to find better ways to do it in consultation. With the Michael, community. can I make one other comment I should have made when I was talking? And sure. that is one of the things that I thought occurred in the past, which the government could well consider, was when Wayne Goss was around, and it happened to be Labor, but irrespective of politics, there was a group called the Planning and Infrastructure Coordinating Committee, which was a, a committee comprising the director generals of various departments which impact upon infrastructure and planning. It forced those departments to talk to each other before it went to Cabinet. So then you didn't have people doing sweetheart deals to get things through Cabinet because the politicians only take advice, they don't really often understand the decisions they're making. So that mechanism I thought was very powerful and very useful. And I used to brief the Director General in my department at that time. And it was really informative to sit in in those conversations. 
One of those led to me being involved in commenting upon uh, injurious affection, uh, the compensation paid to politicians. It also led to having uh, resource allocations of water and land and extractive materials not part of the development assessment process that needs to be done outside that process through planning. Mm. They're the sort of things you can do if you've got people that are willing to talk and sit down and listen to the other pers person's perspective. Yeah, yeah, well said. Okay, look, I, I realise we're a little behind time here. Um, thanks uh, largely to my long intro and our technical difficulties in the minute. So uh, in the middle, so I'll throw straight over to Sophie now, and then we'll probably have a slightly abridged time for Q and A, but we'll certainly get through as many of those as we can. So um, over to you now, Sophie. Thanks. Oh, no, I haven't quite got you there. No, I can't hear you now still. Sorry, I don't. Uh... Sorry. Oh, there we go. You're on. You're live, Sophie. Thanks. Go for okay, broke. Thank you. Um, thanks, Michael. So um, just like many other people, I have a lot of uh, opinions on um, community consultation. So um, I think that when community consultation is taken by a developer, it is the exception. And but I think we also need to think about whether it is the responsibility of the private sector to be doing this consultation, because we've seen a lot of instances in many, many fields where the private sector will undertake uh, focus groups or whatever they're doing. And the results that come out just re re like represent what they are wanting. And we don't really know what everyone says. So I think that on large scale developments, there should be more involved requirements for community consultations and that we should look at a way to incorporate the community consultation in a more meaningful way. And I think perhaps a way to do this is a higher level of assessment than impact accessible. So a case study of this is in Western Australia, where the state government has established a development assessment panel for large or complex projects. So it's generally the same message, sorry, generally the same method as if council is assessing a development application, except it's done through a panel. So these are DAs with estimated values of over $20 million. And then they are assessed by this panel. And if, you, if there's an estimated value of between two and 20 million stand to come back to the developer on their application, then they can have the choice to opt into this panel system. So while this example doesn't incorporate more community consultation, I think that it does give weight to how important these, um, these type of applications can be. And it's like with um, Michael said about the Woolworths redevelopment. So this is a massive urban revitalization project and it's code assessment. So not only does it, they're saying it doesn't matter what the community thinks, then largely the community won't even know that it's happening, which is quite scary. So I think that another thing that we should be thinking about or putting more focus and time to is neighborhood plans. So neighborhood plans should really be focusing on bottom-up planning. And I think as they are at the moment, it's a bit of a missed opportunity by council. So I think neighborhood plans could be formed by massive, massive public participation and maybe some more interactive systems saying, show us what you would put where in your suburb and then we can show the community that it can be fun it can be interactive and ultimately the council cares about your opinion so um, as a personal anecdote my boss lodged a submission to a uh, Kalounja neighborhood plan some of the issues he pointed out were spelling errors and he received back from council was basically thanks for your submission but we're keeping it as it is so I think this really indicates the council doesn't place much importance on the opinion of the community when they're drafting neighborhood plans. So at the moment, the level of assessment on an application is rarely changed through neighborhood plans and it only focuses on things like height restrictions, setbacks, et cetera. But I think that it could be extremely, extremely fine grained, like perhaps to the point of block by block master planning through community consultation and council planners saying, this is what we envision here. And if your DA matches that, then it can be code accessible. If it doesn't, impact accessible. I think that's an, something we could think about. And I also want to talk about planning and politics. And I think we don't talk about this enough. Like it really, really matters <laughs> who is in power and, that, and then what development they want to come through. So for my thesis, I did a lot of 
uh, emphasis on Brisbane's future blueprint, which if anyone doesn't know, it's a strategic planning document outlining the vision for future of development in Brisbane. So there was a lot of propaganda taken about how extensive the community engagement would be for this document, except if you look at the literal results from the community, there is mass inconsistency between the final document and the community responses. So in the most popular form of engagement was a Plan Your Brisbane online game. The uh, question put to the community was, what type of housing do you think should be increased in supply? The most popular answer was medium density housing. And yet, how was this incorporated into the blueprint? The council placed a blanket ban on townhouses in low density areas, saying that it's inappropriate development. So not only is this like completely contradictory to the idea of performance-based planning, it also discourages housing diversity and opportunity for vulnerable people, people with less money, etc. So the council is acting like, you know, they're acting like they're standing in favor of maintaining the single density detached housing lifestyle by putting the ban on townhouses and their emphasis on protecting the Brisbane backyard and they're hiding behind this community engagement that they've apparently taken and they're slapping a sticker on the blueprint saying that this is approved by all of you. This is approved by the people. This is what you told us to do. So also the blueprint is supposed to be in support of the Southeast Queensland Regional Plan, except they don't really support each other in views of future housing. So with the ban on townhouses, council is saying that they won't really budge on densifying. And yet when the Southeast Queensland Regional Plan was launched, uh, Deputy Premier Jackie Trad stated that unlocking the land that's already within the urban footprint is the way forward. So there's less demand for extending, expanding into our natural area. So we've got this contradiction for direction for development between like the LMP Brisbane City Council and the Labor State Government. So I think we shouldn't deny that politics is such an enormous factor in development in these strategic planning documents and therefore what is approved or rejected. So that's basically all I wanted to say. Thanks, Michael. That was great, Sophie, thanks. It's, um, it's very easy to look at uh, questions of planning as being purely technical, but I, I think it's really important for us to remember that, um, yeah, that, that politics is, is a real part of it and that dialogue between state and local councils is is just so fundamental in just the same way that dialogue with the community affected is as as I think all of us have touched on um all right now in the time we have left uh let's jump straight to the questions now I know we did uh, the the event information for this suggested that it was from two until four which is a very very long time to be online for two whole hours uh for particularly for viewers so we might maybe try and keep the Q&A to about sort of 20 minutes or so, um, if that works for everyone. And I might start at, um, look, I'll start at the top. We've, we've got some of the questions that were asked in advance um, have been quite thoroughly addressed, I think, in some of the answers, but maybe um, we got a number of really great questions from John in St. Lucia um which does go to a lot of what uh what we've spoken about but we might maybe we'll touch on this as a starting point given that consultation was so so central to the questions uh to to what we've had to say so far so john has said um in the preparation of a planning scheme the current arrangements in the 2016 planning act for community consultation appear to be quite tokenistic often those matters of public concern are not addressed at all or not in a meaningful way so the question is, what consultation mechanisms should be introduced so that the community has a real say in the preparation of a planning scheme? Um, now, look, I, uh, I don't think I should take the reins on this one first, although I have my thoughts on that. Um, but perhaps, uh, perhaps we'll go around in the same order we did before. Does anyone, Elizabeth, are you, are you happy to add your thoughts to that? Yeah, actually I am, Michael. Um, I, when we actually did Fruit Park, because there had been such a huge amount of community interest in Fruit Park, the Brisbane City Council allowed the community to run the consultation process for Fruit Park. So we held community meetings and we had a facilitator who sat down um, 
and his process was quite a good one. And one of the things that I really liked about it is we actually got to hear from the um, quieter people in the community, like the more the introverted people. But the outcome of that was people sat around tables. We had over, I think it was over 120 people attended that consultation. They all put forward their ideas. We then put all the ideas together and the, we ended up with a list that were the things that were most wanted. One of the interesting things to come out of that was a grandmother's comment that she was looking for a place for her 8 to 12-year-old grandchildren to play. Now, there had been no such thing ever built before, um, because, but we looked at Fruit Park being as part of the, the um, Gregory Park as well, which had a, a tiny children's area. And she said, so the council, to their credit, took that on board and they actually built a playground for eight to 12 year olds, which can I tell you has been incredibly successful. But the other thing that was included in that were things that were actually quite simple. And it was something as simple as a concrete pump so that small children can learn to ride their push bike or their scootery thing or whatever it is, you know, areas to kick a ball. And everybody had a different idea but they also were adults and they realized that there were going to be limitations to how much you could spend so do you know they say that community consultation i know that it's time consuming i know that it's difficult but if you inform people and you let them bring your their ideas to you you can be very pleasantly surprised about the outcome of that. Yeah, agreed. I think um, I've always struggled to understand the reluctance on the part of, of uh, developers or decision makers to consult proactively because you ultimately, as you say, you do get those ideas from the community that you wouldn't otherwise tap into, but you also bring the community along uh, as, you know, along for the ride. And I think, um, yeah, that that's in my mind one of the biggest issues is the type of communication and the process and and actually you know setting some really clear requirements for councils in developing planning schemes to you know to engage in meaningful process um, but I suppose the other the other things that come to the front of mind for me are, are the time frames just ensuring that rather than having you know very um, narrow tight uh, statutory time frames that constrain the amount of consultation that we we leave those open or even mandate much longer time frames for consultation um, and I won't harp on about this too much but I think there's value in the idea and this is something that the Greens brought to the local government election and and it's a, an idea that we've been keen on for a long while the idea of actually having a community vote on planning schemes so that you you do ultimately get to the point where you know the community can similar to what we do with our you know, our electoral representation, um, actually have a genuine vote. Um, now, that's a, that's a complicated idea. It's not, a, not necessarily a simple one to implement, but, um, but to have some binding requirement for the community's view to be represented. Um, I've banged on about that enough. Uh, uh, Sophie or Howard, do, would you like to add anything more about how consultation should be better done? Yes, well, I I've certainly uh, believe there's a major need to improve the planning stage because planning is done as a, almost a mechanistic thing where people get piles of information which they can't relate to their situation. So there's got to be a better opportunity for people to understand how that planning scheme might look when it's implemented, how it might impact upon them and how the various issues in it that they would like to see are given effect through the planning scheme. The tendency is to say, you know, a bit like the old story where you have a meeting and you put people's views on a bit of paper, you stick on the wall and you click them at the end and you say, well, now we'll plate them and make a decision on it. That just, that doesn't allow for planning to occur. That's just a whole lot of, you know, brainstorms occurring, but no consolidated story coming out of it. You know, I've got some views, for example, on the, the way we might have a, a, the, uh, the green bridges being built. The tendency is to talk about where the bridge is built rather than how it fits in with how the bridge may be serviced the rest of the community and how it might link up with other things. So we tend to see things as being 
site related things without looking at the sort of general context as well as the specifics. I've actually provided notes that I mentioned earlier to community groups on how they might input to planning schemes because they don't know how to input. They get asked to provide information which can't be used by planners and won't be used by planners, I suspect, rather than actually seeking from them information that from them that might be useful in planning. Uh, the same thing applies with the development assessment stage. I've actually been interacting with the Urban Development Institute of Australia to try to get them to release for public use their guidelines for their members on how they should involve people in decision-making on development. And they're reluctant to do that because they think that they'll be hit around the head because it'll be seen as being a um, demonstrating their shortcomings in some way. I've been through it and done a critique of it. I sent it back to the UDIA and said, excellent document. This is an opportunity for mutual agreement between the two parties. You're going to use it for that purpose, but they're still reluctant to do it. I made some comments back to the council on their consultation policy, and I offered to meet with them and talk about it, but that's never happened. So you wonder whether people in the community know more about some of the people that are making decisions. And that's a bit of a shame if that's the case because there'd be some benefits from listening to people like Elizabeth to how you might do things in a practical way. Elizabeth and I are not against things. We want things done well, but you'll only be done well if people understand what's going on. The point that Sophie made before of identifying a likely use for a site is what I thought planning was about rather than you can do what you like provided me some code. So mm. an unexpected use comes up. So it's about people uh, being encouraged to have development applications coming in to meet a identified need for a site rather than putting any uh, site you like. When the, the TRICARE one came up, I approached the local councillor and I said, what was the minimum requirements for the site as far as the council was concerned? Stony silence. But they're making a decision on something without no appreciation of what the site might be suitable for and how it might be used. It was yeah. about waiting for someone to put up an offer before they actually made a decision on it. It's the wrong way about going about consultation. Yeah, good point. Look, Sophie, would you like to add anything or should we jump on to the next question? I'll leave it up to you. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that everyone said and um, it was drummed into us in uni or the IAP2 spectrum of public participation and we were told over and over the processes. But I think that overall, Unfortunately, you can't force people to care what the community thinks. If they're only going into it for the wrong reasons, if they're going into development, like to put a development up to make money, then um, I don't know. I just think it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a hard thing to, to comment on. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, look, we'll, I, th I, I really would love to spend more time on these excellent questions from John, but we've had some more come through as the live has been running. So I think we might, um, we might prioritize those. Um, uh, where are we? Okay. So we've got a, a question from Andrew Haynes from YouTube. He said, I like your block by block planning idea, Sophie, but there is a current proposal for out of scope development on central road. The other side of the road is zoned for hire. So why not us too? Um, a question. I might actually, I might treat that as a rhetorical question. I think that's perhaps the way it was intended. Um, uh, I've got a question from uh, Sonia on Facebook. Uh, she said, thanks everyone for your presentation. Well, you're very welcome. I'm sure I speak for everyone. Uh, planning is an inexact science and open to interpretation and politics. Given these facts, what are your thoughts on every local government area engaging a social planner? There's a slightly left field idea from what we've been discussing so far. I might, um, that was a, an enthusiastic response from you, Sophie. I might throw to you first. Yeah, I think that that is a, an excellent question. And um, another personal anecdote, someone I used to work for, I said to them when I was learning a lot about the social impact assessments, um, how often has this firm undertaken social impact assessment or put them out for hire? And um, the director laughed. So I think that it's um, quite something to think about how often it is ignored. And I think it's 
one of the it's one of the pillars of sustainability and often the most ignored because it's the hardest to put a pin on and I think that again it's because it takes up so much time but um, I think that social planners do wonderful wonderful work and I think that that would be great if we had that more um, it was a bit of a bigger field and um, social impact assessments are yes I agree very important. Yeah, and look, I might even, just before we move on to other responses, I uh, for those playing along at home, this is kind of one of the lesser known, um, you know, lesser known aspects of planning and I suppose triple bottom line sustainability. Um, so uh, given, Sophie, your most recent experience uh, in academia and studying this sort of stuff, could you give us a, you know, 25 words or less, what is a social planner? What, what's their role in planning? Um, oh, that's a hard one. So social planners, I suppose, um, look at those aspects that we can't quite, they're a little bit more intangible. So we'd go to a community and kind of say, what is the social, what are the social interactions? They often look at developments in relations to perhaps schools or churches and looking at, um, is this going to be good for our society? Thinking the proximity of these things, does this belong in this society? So that definitely wasn't 25 words or less. And um, <laughs> I found it difficult to put a, um, put a line under it. But yeah, it's really giving you a, um, like a framework of that society of the suburb, um, so a bit of a demographic background and yeah, and saying what will be best for them. That's great. That's very helpful. And 25 words or less was entirely unreasonable request at the outset. But uh, um, open to uh, Howard or Elizabeth, do you want to, do you want to address that? Oh, everyone's keen. All right. Well, I yeah. might, might throw it to Howard first, just quickly, yeah. and then we'll go to Elizabeth. That's um, right. I think that, um, as you pointed out, um, if you look at what is called ecological sustainability, um, social, economic and ecological issues, uh, social, economic and ecological issues come up and need to be addressed. Um, certainly it's important you have people who understand interactions and facilitate communications. Um, my dealing with the social impact people, they play a very valuable role because they encourage the planners to look at a different dimension. It, it helps communication. My background's in natural resource management type issue is about planning of resources. And that's an area that, that, that doesn't get very well treated, but it's a part of the economic and a part of the environmental. So that's an issue that's really important for planners to be aware of, as is the social. But unless you get planners being prepared to, to talk to those people, rather than arguing or seeking support for their predetermined decision they want made, you, you'll end up with the same thing we've got now. We need to have these people, like social planners, contributing to the decision-making process so they, they're more informed decisions. Yeah, great. And over to you, Elizabeth, while we're um, on. The just the comment that I would make, um, Michael, is that I think we forget developers actually have to have a social license to develop and as a community we actually support those developments in some way at, at all times and by having somebody who looks at the social side of things you actually look at the, the benefits that are intangible at first that can become very real benefits so for example we have allowed um, the the Milton building at, at, by the railway station has five levels of car parking before you get to the first level of occupation on that site. It does have restaurants down the bottom and things, but they are closed at 10 o'clock at night. Now, when you have um, buildings that actually have occupation at the ground level for 24 hours a day, what that actually leads to is a safer environment for people to move around an area. And that is an intangible benefit, but in fact, it's a very real benefit to society because if people feel that they can take part in their local community and feel safe to take part in their local community 24 hours a day, that's actually worth quite a lot of money to, to a community, I feel. Because if you don't feel safe, ask somebody who came from South Africa, what is it worth to be able to walk around a community and not be looking over your shoulder? 
it's, it's, and those sorts of things, they're the first thing that's dropped as, you know, when you sort of say, oh, money's tight, but they're actually some of the most important things that we should be considering. It's, it's like you say green space. Why do you provide green space? Well, you provide green space because it actually leads to better mental health for people who live in an area. And if you're cramming people together into smaller accommodation, then you need to be providing the other side of that for them so that they have good quality places to spend time in. Yeah, here, yeah, here. Yeah. Um... I'm, I'm going to jump on to one more question here, which actually is perhaps more of a comment that we might like to add to. But um, uh, Louise on Facebook has, uh, she's commented, further to planning, um, it's often around the needs of middle class white people. We end up with freestanding nuclear family houses, shopping centres, coffee shops, daycare centres, office blocks. But where are the vibrant community spaces? Where are the spaces for teenagers to gather that aren't cost prohibitive, prohibitive or religious based? We have a university with beautiful grounds. Why isn't the surrounding community encouraged to use those facilities? How do we access the waterfront? You know, I, 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 again, it's um, you know, it's a very real question and a really important question that ties back to the last one directly. I'd suggest, and um, and I think it's so important. For, you know, it's I think maybe asked rhetorically, but what it points to is that we uh, we need to find ways to really to to put an actual value on those things, you know, from the community's perspective and, um, and recognise that um, you, you need the community's input to discover what it is that makes a vibrant community. And you also, as decision makers and as governments at either level, you need to create space, both physical and uh, space in conversation with the community to make that happen. Um, Anyone else want to throw that? This might, given that we're at three nineteen, this might be like, um, it's a very, it's a very high note to finish on. So I, I might just throw that idea around to each of you. Um, if you have any final comments you want to make uh, in response to Louise's comment, um, perhaps Howard, are you happy to you happy to wrap up first? Okay, I, I think that it, it is important to uh, have that um, uh, flexibility and, and and opportunity for. Um, that sort of involvement. I, I, I think that the, to me, the important thing about, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about um, native title issues recently and about racism. I think that there's a really important issue related to self-determination and we should have an opportunity for self-determination of all people. Uh, and I don't think the planning scheme really lends itself to that. Um, I think that's a, a fundamental issue. And, and um, to make a, a, a side comment, Separate to that, I, I would like to see um, there be some basic logic in why certain developments are code accessible and when they might be uh, made impact accessible and to have appropriate community, community involvement in those. I think that it's really important we have the community involved in development and where there's likely to be conflict arising to make certain that there's adequate involvement of the community. Yeah, well said. Who's next? Elizabeth's unmuted, so I'll, th I'll throw to you next, Elizabeth. <laughs> um, do you know, Michael, the, the thing is that we lose um, the livability of an area by degrees. I, I was talking to a planner yesterday and one of the things that he said a number of years ago, there was a 20 metre limit from the high water mark of the river. And he said there were a couple of exceptions and just slowly over time, those exceptions were made more and more and more. And in fact, now what we've done is we've almost lost that continue, continuity along the the. Um, high water mark of the river and that's the way that ha it has happened with public spaces as well I would suggest to you that there were like creek beds and all sorts of other things that we have just compressed and compressed and compressed and allowed more and more development over they were areas that 
not only allowed wildlife to move through our suburbs, it also allowed our children and our young people. And, you know, it gave spaces for people to be that were not shopping centre forecourts, as I call them, you know, or paid spaces. Um, I believe those sorts of things in the community make an incredible difference to, and, and just things like um, street trees or just little spaces that actually become local meeting places that are just the community decides that's a nice place to meet to be. And it's you need to have those spaces built into areas, into any area, any neighbourhood. Absolutely. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. And over to you, Sophie. Um, thanks, Michael. I think that is a wonderful comment. And I think first and foremost, we need to make a platform for diversity, like at the top or at in the plan making and decision making areas, because like those diverse people from diverse groups are the ones who will know best what is best for their group, and then they can implement those changes. And um, also, I liked um, the comment about accessing uh, UQ and the grounds and the green spaces. I think another thing to think about that is the active transport network that we have. And I think that the, um, the Riverwalk will do wonders for that. So hopefully that will improve. But yeah, I think that the council especially and or when assessing developments so or everyone just needs to consider a little bit more about the active transport networks that we can encourage and how we can go forth in that. And then that can be a bit of a nicer, um, a nicer way for people to enjoy their surroundings and really like it's a bit of a place making kind of a place making activity in itself. And it's, I think it's a pretty easy one. So I think it should be further encouraged. Yeah, agreed, absolutely. Uh, look, it's, uh, it's approaching 3.30. So I am gonna draw a line under the forum today. Um, I am so appreciative um, to everyone for, for signing on for this and uh, turning up and having a listen, but especially to the three of you for joining me and sharing your, your thoughts and your expertise. Um, I think it's, a, it's a, a really important and obviously an ongoing conversation that we need to have as a community. So um, I do feel like uh, certainly, you know, for me in this role, um, the discussion we've been able to have with the community so far is just a starting point I do, honestly, I, I firmly believe that we need some quite drastic reform of the planning system and we could have, uh, you know, a, a forum like this on 17 different aspects of what that reform might look like. You know, it's a it's a really big task, but it's one that we need to be mindful of, I think, um, in certainly we're mindful of it and all that we're doing um, as my office in, in the work that we do. And, and I think we need to likewise uh, do so as a community. Um, I suppose just to uh, to round it off, I wanted to just flag a few things that that I and my office can do to help. Um, if there are if there are issues that you're having in your local neighbourhood um, around development, with I think one of the issues, one of the you know um, the realities of the current system that has certainly in my experience, and I think it's come out of the conversation today, um, is that. Uh, if you want to see change on any given front, whether that's about a particular development or more broadly, um, when we get opportunities to contribute to the development of plans, um, mobilising people, mobilising your community and making sure that that voice is heard is much harder than it should be, but there are ways we can help you. So for the community to take an active role in getting people on board, making sure people know what's happening, um, that's fundamentally important. So we can help you print up flyers to do some letterboxing to let people know what's happening and to get as many people as possible engaged in that conversation. Um, if you want at any stage to, to come and discuss with me a particular issue or development or how we can help in more detail, um, please do just get in touch. We've got a, you know, a, very, um, a very open policy here in terms of any, any constituent, anyone who I represent, they have a right to come and have a meeting with me about the issues that affect them. Uh, yeah, Howard, sorry, I'll throw to you, you got something one, to add? One, one last comment I'd like to make is that I interact also with the local councillor, which is LMP, and I interact with you as a Green. I think it's an issue which is across politics, and unfortunately there's a tendency, as we mentioned before, planning can be politicised, the tendency for people to polarise. I think we need to get across 
all political parties to get support for these sort of changes that need through the Planning Act. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good point, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, uh, you know, I, this is this is not me throwing shade, but I, we we did invite the local councillor to to participate in the forum today, um, and he wasn't able to. But uh, but it's a really good point, Howard, and one that we need to be mindful of. That um, I, I think there are um, certainly the the different parties have have you know let's say. Um, what we might at least perceive as long-held positions and some entrenched culture around um, certain aspects of development and community consultation. Um, it shouldn't be that way. And we have seen some really productive changes recently. The, the fact that we've now got um, this statewide ban on donations from developers, I think it, it creates a really important break between um, developers' interests and political processes. So I think that was an incredibly positive move. And I think I'd suggest that that makes now the perfect time, given that we've seen that break, for us to really engage in a process of reform where um, where commercial interests and political interests can, you know, can be unteased, uh, teased apart a little a little more effectively than they have been able to be historically. Um, but yeah, uh, look. Um, just before we wrap up, just a couple more things. If uh, we, I would love to, and I think we will endeavour to, given that things are looking pretty good on the, the COVID-19 front, I hope we can have some kind of forum like this um, subsequently. Um, I don't think this is a conversation that, that, you know, we can pull up stumps on anytime soon and expect to achieve a great deal. So, um, so I hope you'll keep engaged with the office and with me. Um, if we can help facilitate any conversations that are organically already happening in the community. I'd love to see more of that going on as well. So, um, because I do know that we have an incredibly engaged and, uh, you know, a, a well-resourced and a, um, the community around here, I think, has a, in some ways a better handle on planning and the issues that surround that than, um, than a lot of others do because we have, you know, there's so many tensions and, um, and I guess the challenges for inner urban areas like, like Maywa are, are somewhat, you know, they're a bit more pronounced than in other places. So I, I know it's happening. I know people are having these conversations and we'd love to be a part of them and to, to help um, foster that um, and, you know, get more people in on in on the gig. Okay, it is precisely 3.30. So I think that's the perfect time for me to sign off and say thank you once again to everyone for being here. Apologies also for the technical hiccup in the middle. And um, yeah, and... Look, we'll, uh, this will be available on the Facebook page if anyone wants to look back over it. Apologies if we didn't get to your questions, but if you've got a specific question you want answered uh, after the forum, please get in touch by email. Um, easy to find on the website or the Facebook page. And with that, I think the tech is ready for us to sign off. So thank you very much. Um, hope to keep thank in touch. You. Thank you. Bye. See you.